Hey, George. How are you, man? Great. Uh, my name is Justin. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the Geek Centric Podcast. Um, I am absolutely stoked to be talking to the voice of Hank McCoy or Beast from one of my favorite childhood uh, shows. And yeah, it's just a, a great privilege here to chat, have the opportunity to chat with you. Now, you're going to be in Toronto, uh, I hear, for Toronto Comic Con. Um, yep. have you, have you been to conventions before Are you a convention goer? Oh yeah. Yeah. We yeah. started doing them just before the pandemic when, uh, Eric and Julia Leewald released their book before, uh, previously on X-Men mm -hmm. and they gathered a small number of us to go and do a Comic-Con down in New Brownfells, Texas. There was okay. going to be the first X-Men reunion and <laughs> that's when we started doing the shows. Right. Absolutely. And now it looks like there's a whole other reason to do this reunion uh, with oh, yeah. another show on the horizon uh, coming out later this month. Now that answers, I guess, sort of my question: How, how have you stayed in? Have you stayed in contact with your fellow castmates uh, all these years? Well, yeah, because uh, we all do an other animation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd seen uh, Cal a lot of times uh, at other auditions because we still did voiceovers, right? And uh, I ran into uh, Norm Spencer before he passed away. He lives in, used to live in my neighborhood. Right. So we all kept in touch. And uh, the this just gave us another reason to to hang together and right go and do talk shows all over the place. Right, and talk about something refreshing and new. Right, it's, you know, there's there's a lot of people that appreciate obviously the the past episodes and the past show as as well. But now with X Men ninety seven, uh, it looks like there's going to be a lot more to talk about. Going all the way back, you know, when you started, when you got the role of of Hank and Beast, um, how did you find that voice? How did you go about crafting that voice? Because I did read somewhere that you were more familiar with the source material, like the X Men comics, than others. Is that true? Well, yeah, I. When everybody was reading the audition sides, they called this Project X. Mm -hmm. And I was familiar with the X-Men comic books from when I was a kid. The first one came out in 1963, which would have made me about 11 years old. Right. And I remember seeing it and reading it and being familiar with it. So that when I read the audition sides, <laughs> Project X, this is X-Men. Right. And immediately I got really excited because this is a chance to do something that meant something to you when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. And here you're revisiting it as an adult mm -hmm. and uh, being able to play a character that used to shine in the comic books. Yeah. You no, know, this was like just as exciting as when I got to play Chief Chirpa in uh, Land of the Ewoks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At the time, Star Wars was probably the best movie that I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And then to be given the chance to play Chief Chirpa, you know, what better thing could happen? Right. X-Men. That's what better thing could happen. You know? <laughs> so yeah, and, and, and it seems interesting the voice. They wanted a natural voice. They didn't want us to do right. cartoony. Mm -hmm. They wanted this to be realistic, mm -hmm. as realistic as a mutant can be. Mm -hmm. And uh you just tried to make him sound very smart to find the, the voice of reason. Yes. You know, he was all those things that uh I tried to aspire to when I was uh dealing with all the situations in my life. Right. And uh, there was a great connection between me and uh, the character of Hank. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I was actually, that was one of my questions that is, how do you connect with your character? So that's, that's amazing. Cause you know, I think he was always the voice of reason. And if anything, he was the empathy and uh, compassion uh, when so many people around, obviously in this, this world of the X-Men, there was a lot of hate to, yeah. and sides that were being picked. And Hank always seemed to be the voice of reason, as you said, or he just had a lot of empathy. And I don't know, for myself, he was a character I always connected with because it's hard, it's easy to understand one side, but you always want to be a person that can understand both sides. And I always feel like that's how Beast really uh, situated himself in, in, in the show and was always depicted as. Now, you're coming back to this character 25 plus years later. Was there... Was it like getting on a bike again, or was it? Oh was yeah, very much. Was so. it like, yeah? Was there anything that you had to try differently? And how much has the industry changed in your eyes? Like, obviously, we've heard a lot with you know, obviously the pandemic and everything. People doing more records at home, less in studio. Were you before and when you guys were doing the show back in the '90s? Were you guys recording together? And has that changed now? Are you guys recording more like apart from each other? Well, now we're we're barely even seeing each other in the studio. Everybody's right. so far apart. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, occasionally you, you run into the person who was recording ahead of you if you arrived 10 minutes early. But a lot of times they're on different days, mm -hmm. the recording sessions. So you're just going in there alone and you do right. your thing and you go home. The very first season that we did the original X-Men, we all recorded together like we were doing radio drama. But cool. it was a very time-consuming thing because every time that you had to speak, everybody else's microphone had to be turned off. Mm. Then you gave your line. Then your microphone got turned off. And everybody else's got turned back on. So it, it, the whole idea of spontaneity was killed because it took so much time to do all that. Right. And it it made a, a recording session that should have taken an hour last like five hours. And so they stopped doing it because it was very inefficient. Right. And then we all went to individual records. Unless there was a two-person scene, then they bring the, the two of us together. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you don't even really see the other people at the sessions because uh, you can do it remotely. Right. A lot of people have studios in their own home, so they can do the recordings there. You know, I still go to the studio. I, I didn't bother to build a studio in my room. Right. Right. No, of course. We, we've talked. We've actually talked to uh, D. Bradley Baker, who does a lot of his voice work, and he has like his own little like uh, setup in his office. And he talks about you know the difference and and how people like to situate themselves. And you know, working with someone will always yield something different than when you're working on your own. Obviously. Yeah. Right. So uh, I feel like you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities, but as you said, it was probably not as efficient when everyone's together and you got to kill mics and turn mics on and stuff like that. It just draws out the process. Um, have you seen any of the recent, uh, any of the new episodes? Have they, have they shown you any of them at yeah, all? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the uh, little snippets of it, uh, cause we've gone in to do ADR audio right. dialogue replacement. And, uh, would you, would you I've be able to little snippets of it? It looks fabulous. Right. I haven't seen a full episode. Okay, so you haven't seen a full episode. I was going to ask if there was any episode that you would be excited for fans to see from the upcoming show. But if there's, if you if you can't comment on that, that that's totally oh, I can't. I can't oh, because okay. uh, until the show is released, we can't make any kind of for sure way or spoiler alerts or anything like that. Yeah, no worries. All you can say is uh, it looks fabulous. You won't yeah. be disappointed. The writing yeah. is just as good as it was back in the nineties. Uh, they've kept the spirit of the show alive. Mm -hmm. All of our characters are consistent with what we did before. Yeah. So uh, that's all we can say. Yeah. And I think a huge part of that spirit is bringing back the, the original voice cast as much as possible. Obviously, times have changed and maybe not everyone's here. But at the end of the day, that helps to really forge that spirit and keep yeah. that that continuity. We're also introducing a lot of new characters. Yes, so I've heard, yes. And, and they're I'm basing a lot of it on the uh, current comic books. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So it's, that's uh, everybody that's working on the new show had to be a diehard fan of X-Men. Right. In the original series, a lot of the people that were working on the show had never even really heard of X-Men. Right. They'd never seen a, a comic book. They were just animators or writers. Mm -hmm. and so they had to familiarize themselves with the whole genre and yeah. now in this series everybody that's working on it is a diehard fan so they're already well aware of all the characters and all the stories and the direction that they probably want to take these yeah. things too right there's a sense of confidence which you know now that marvel's there and, and behind it and kind of pushing it in a direction there's going to be that that universe building elements um you know circling back to where we started with conventions um you know, convent, like a lot of people talk about when they go to conventions, especially talent that gets to interact with fans as, as really great moments. Do you have any any moments in, 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 that you've really had great call outs with fans and, and moments with fans that have, have recognized and, and, you know, appreciated your work? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember the very first time that somebody came to my table and they were so overcome that they actually started to cry. Yeah. And this was a grown man just because the show meant so much to him yeah. as a child. He found so much refuge in what we were doing mm -hmm. that uh, he was overcome with emotion and had to go and compose himself before he could come back and have a conversation. Wow. So this is something we were never aware of when we were doing the original show because they kept all that away from us. We didn't right. have any idea how much fan mail was coming in. All we knew is that we kept getting renewed for five seasons, which basically is the uh, the target for mm -hmm. syndication. 
Yep. So if you could keep a series going for five years, that was major syndication and that would ensure that the show would go on. Not necessarily in recordings, but it would live as a syndicated product. Right. So that was our goal. And then when we achieved that, the show ended and we never even thought about, you know, we just went on to our next jobs. So when it got revived and we started doing these uh, Comic Cons and we started meeting the fans, it was so overwhelming how much the show really meant to these people. And it's something that never really entered our minds. To us, mm -hmm. we were just doing a, a piece of entertainment that lasted for five years and we went off and did the next show. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were doing other shows at the same time. Mm -hmm. While we were recording X-Men, I was also on uh, Maniac Mansion, a live action yes. show. Yeah. And I was playing a four-year-old mutant <laughs> <laughs> who was a giant. Right. And so I would go to the studio for Maniac Mansion was about a mile, two miles away from the studio we did a recording of X-Men in. And I'd be dressed up as a four-year-old wearing kids' clothes, and I'd hop on my motorcycle and ride over to uh, the X-Men studio, do my recording, and then ride back to keep working on uh, Maniac Mansion. Right. So you're kind of splitting your time and yeah. doing, doing both. That's so great, though. Like, I love that you kind of get to see the residual effects of what X-Men meant to fans, yeah. you know, it, in, in this in this capacity. And, and without the Comic-Cons, we never would have known. Yeah. It's it really does allow you to connect the dots and and see the people and understand and I it, rightfully so the show is is uh, it's more it's lasted more than five years do you know what I mean like it, yeah. it's it's gone so long which is why we're back here in in twenty twenty four uh, and and you're you know you're working on X Men ninety seven and it's about to hit uh, Disney Plus and I think a lot of people are beyond excited especially because of how much the X Men mean not just to the MC, but to people in general, right? They're, they're a symbol of a lot of, of indifference and, and how to over, overcome that. Um, and I know for myself, like I said, to Hank McCoy and, or Beast was always the voice of reason. And, and, and in a lot of ways, and I'm not going to say he taught me empathy, but I saw what empathy looked like. I saw mm -hmm. what compassion looked like. I saw what it meant to have um, two sides to the opinion. Uh, and he wore his mutant his mutancy differently than everyone else, obviously. Well, when you're right? blue. So, exactly. When you're giant and you're blue, it's harder to hide, right? So he had to have a sense of composure and reason. And I think, again, George, your your voice just helped to elevate that, elevate that persona and that character, which is why it's no surprise that someone would get a little emotional, especially if maybe they were struggling with something and you might have been the voice of reason for them, right? So. It's, it's happened more than once. Nice. And a lot of the a lot of the fans from the nineties are bringing their own kids yep. to meet us and introducing them to the old series and having watch sessions with their kids. So you know, these are the things that make you kind of misty, you know, that right. what well, you thought like was just a job meant so much to somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it helped them, you know, yep. that they found refuge in it. That's that's the beautiful part of it, right? That's Your the beautiful art. part, the most valuable part of what we do. Awesome. Well, George, this has been an absolute delight. I I think my time is up. I'm not sure if I if I still have more time, but uh, I'm I'm I've asked all my questions. Uh, I'm so excited to have had the opportunity to talk. I'm looking forward to seeing you both at Toronto Comic Con when I'm there, but also uh, on uh, X-Men 97 when it hits Disney Plus later Well, this it's going to be released. The first episode will air March the 20th. Yeah. both. I think they're doing them back. There's two episodes that are airing oh, back on back. that day. Yeah, so You guys know more than we do. Well, I'm actually going to be talking with Bo uh, later, uh, probably in the in the coming weeks, uh, who is the showrunner for yeah. X-Men. Uh, Wonderful so guy. I'm excited to I talk to him. him. Yeah, I have a lot of questions already uh, already written. Any any fond memories working with him? Well, I think I've only seen him once or twice in the early recording sessions. I don't know if he sits in. Uh, the only person we really see is uh, Meredith, mm -hmm. who's directing the series, and everybody else who's listening in uh, doesn't really appear on the on the screens. Right. So there's I think Oh, is a there. wonderful, wonderful guy, and uh, I love him dearly. I think he's uh, dedicated to this show. Yeah, and uh, I hope it goes on for a while. 
<laughs> likewise, likewise, George. I hope we're hope we'll be talking to you again soon. And I I, I didn't realize you were the truck driver in yeah. X Men One who was driving That's right. Rogue. That's cool. I did not know that. That's a cool little Easter egg to get the voice of Beast in the. Well, in what movie. happened was. Uh, I, they put out a call for all these small roles that, that Canadians play in the American movies when they come to town. Right. And so my agent sent me out and uh, right for the truck driver, he was about five lines. And the uh, stunt coordinator, it was a, an old acquaintance of mine, and he leaned over to Brian Singer. And he said, that's the voice of Beast. And Brian called me over to the table and he said, without your show, I wouldn't be making this movie today. And Damn. Uh, wow. That's a heavy truck driver. Yeah, that's heavy. That's yeah. cool. That's really great to know. Because I think, again, not to, again, just do loops around here. I think before we had the MCU, before we had any of those X-Men movie, this X-Men series, the X-Men animated from the 90s, was all that everyone had. And yeah. in a lot of their minds, that was the Beast, that was the Wolverine, that was the Cyclops. And that's why so many people are looking when they see these live action options or live action sort of traits happening. They want to see elements of of what was done there. Yeah. The theme well, song. The Brian characters. Singer followed the, he was followed the comics and he followed our series. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, George. Again, uh, really looking forward to seeing it at, uh, at uh, Toronto Comic Con. Enjoy you're your time only there, there one day. One day. What day are you there? Friday. Okay. And then so you do. I think uh, we're going to be showing up for the. They're going to have a special screening of the first episode. Oh. In one of the hotel rooms at the convention. Okay. Sweet. And uh, they're going to bring us in to do a little intro and a little Q and A afterwards. But we That's won't amazing. be at the uh, we, at the show. We don't have room. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's I Saturday. imagine. It's, yeah, it's probably a little tight. So, oh, well, that's really great to know. Thank you so much for, again, for taking the time, George. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Well, thanks very much. Check the links in our description to find out how you can see George and the rest of the voice cast for X-Men 97 at this upcoming Toronto Comic-Con.